as as you've heard today, I would like to um, bring you up to date a little bit on some of the uh, what I think are exciting things happening in medicine. Um, and that's we're realizing that um, there are many things in medicine, many things that affect our, our bodies that we did not realize before. Um, and so let's just start with talking about, there's two major oral infectious diseases. The first is caries, which is cavities. And the second is periodontal disease. And periodontal disease is actually um, more than one disease, but ultimately the um, pathological alterations um, are the same. And that is there's loss of tissue surrounding the teeth. Periodontal disease starts out as gingivitis um, and then progresses to periodontitis. And periodontitis is one of the most widespread infectious diseases of humans. So if we look at gingivitis, gingivitis is reversible and it's the inflammation of the tissues um, around the teeth. So at this point, if uh, the individual um, is begins to be very good about their oral hygiene, um, this gingivitis can be reversed so that the tissue uh, will become healthy again. But if not, um, it progresses to periodontitis and the inflammation progresses um, down to the supporting structures of the teeth. And uh, this is progressive and it ultimately uh, involves the ligament supporting and the supporting bone of the, the teeth. And this may result in tooth loss. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> many years ago, um, before the um, invention of, of the more modern drugs for hemophiliacs, uh, if a hemophiliac needed a tooth um, extracted, um, the dentist would put a ligature or a piece of string around the base of the tooth. This would cause periodontitis and then um, it would progress and, and the tooth would be lost. So I want to, um, just is just another diagram showing uh, what health looks like. Um, this is the tooth. <clears throat> um, and what we're really looking at is this um, opening or this little pocket right here. So this is health. Gingivitis is when this is inflamed. So you can see that here. But periodontitis, if you look, um, the tissue has um, come away from the bone and from the tooth. And when you go to the dentist and they do the probing, that's what they're doing. They're putting the probe in this area and they're measuring how deep the, this pocket is. So what, um, does what happens in the mouth have an impact outside the mouth? Well, we know that there's a high prevalence of oral diseases. And as I mentioned previously, there's um, approximately 50 million people in the US who have um, periodontal disease. So in that case, uh, what's there, three, 300 million people in the US? Um, so if there are 50 million, um, that are affected by, um, you know, this disease, you can imagine then uh, being able to better treat this disease would have an impact on public health. And especially if uh, this disease is linked to the more systemic chronic diseases. Okay. Uh, okay. Now it won't <clears throat> go forward. Um, let me see here. Why would it do this?
in the bottom left, there are some arrows. They're in black. Bottom left. Yeah. Well, I can't see oh. the bottom. You try your space bar. The problem is I can't see the bottom on my screen. Oh, oh there okay. Go. Here, I got them. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Again, they were covered up. Um, so sorry about all of this. So periodontal disease is actually um, an infection of a, a group of bacteria. Um, and we have been able to identify more than 700 different microbial species um, from the oral cavity. Now, this doesn't mean each of us has 700 microbial species, but it's 700 that have been identified at least in someone's mouth. Um, and this microbial uh, gamish um, called a biofilm um, actually is also very concentrated in that there are as many as 100 billion bacteria per mil. But of all of these 700 microbial species, there's only a small group um, of the bacteria um, that are most frequently isolated or detected from the um, periodontal pockets. And thus are related most closely to periodontal disease. And there are three of these species called the red complex. I'm going to talk about Porphyromonas gingivalis um, today because it is the most pathogenic um, it, we know the most about um, this organism and it's the most amazing. So this is a picture of colonies of Porphyromonas gingivalis um, growing um, on, a, on a plate. And what, and what we know that, first of all, surprisingly, um, P. gingivalis is anaerobic, which means that it grows, it doesn't grow in the presence of air. Um, if there's air present, um, it either dies or doesn't grow at all. Um, it's uh, black pigmented. It produces several factors that attack host tissues and cells. And as I um, alluded to, this is an important etiologic agent in adult and refractory periodontitis, which are the two major um, periodontal diseases. So, um, Early on, there was an, found to be an association between periodontal disease and atherosclerosis. So what um, it was thought, so let, we need to talk just a moment about atherosclerosis and, and what we know about it now. So for those of you that remember back in the 80s, um, it was thought that cholesterol was the major culprit and that the artery wall was basically just a pipe. Um, it's just the structure. Um, but now we know that the um, artery wall is an integral part of the process of atherosclerosis. Um, and that um, the process of plaque fissuring, which is the breaking open of the plaques um, in the arteries, um, that leads to thrombosis. And then that triggers most clinical coronary events. We know that this fissuring is predicted by a large accumulation of lipid in the plaque um, and by a very high density of lipid laden cells. And lesions with these characteristics constitute only about 10 to 20% of the overall lesion population, but they account for 80 to 90% of the acute um, clinical um, events. So we know now that the initial event is actually damage to the endothelium or the inside of the arteries, and then there's subsequent deposit of cholesterol. So it is considered now that endothelial dysfunction um, is both the key and the gatekeeper of cardiovascular disease. And so the initial event in endothelial dysfunction um, is an acute, can be an acute or chronic infection. 
Um, and then this chronic infection results in the continual injury and repair of the artery walls as atherosclerosis progresses. Uh, so this is just a diagram. Uh, you can see the endothelium um, here and the smooth muscle cells, of course, uh, around it that um, uh, form the um, structure. So this shows um, there's a tear in the endothelium here. There's cholesterol deposits. And what will happen when this ruptures, the cholesterol um, will escape and there will be um, red blood cells that um, aggregate. And then this forms a clot. And then when it goes to the heart, um, it's a, um, can be, as we know, a fatal condition. So this is um, a lumen, a uh, cross-section of, um, of an artery and where there's no um, atherosclerosis. And the endothelial layer is just this inside layer. It's only one cell thick. But as we said, that's, that's actually the important initiating uh, part of atherosclerosis. So these just show occlusion of uh, these individuals. Um, you know, as many of you know, um, you'll be told um, if you have occlusion that it's X percent of um, your artery is occlused. So what is the evidence then of a link between periodontal disease and cardiovascular diseases? Well, First of all, um, patients with uh, cardiovascular disease um, have periodontal disease or have no teeth. I should say many patients. Secondly, um, laboratory-based techniques have found evidence of periodontal bacteria in the atherosclerotic tissues. And then thirdly, um, animal studies um, suggest that P. gingivalis um, can cause, uh, or at least be one of the um, causative agents along with other, perhaps other things that uh, lead to atherosclerosis. And uh, two studies that I uh, specifically wanna point out are ones that were in pigs. Um, when uh, PG was injected, the pigs, um, then acquired or developed atherosclerosis. And in mice models, um, just oral infection, you just paint the bacteria um, on their, their, in their mouth. And this um, greatly accelerates um, atherosclerosis and worsens it um, in these animals. So if we look at human studies, um, Desfero et al, um, studied the association between the presence of periodontal bacteria and carotid artery wall thickness. Um, and they, were, they did this because they, you can use a non-invasive ultrasound scan of the carotid arteries to determine um, how thick the wall is, indicating if there's atherosclerosis. Um, there were over a thousand subjects that had no history of cardiovascular disease. They collected 4,500 subgingival plaque uh, samples, and they found that the overall amount of periodontal plaque was related directly to carotid, carotid artery wall thickness. Um, but for our purposes, I think, and more importantly, is that the presence of the periodontal bacteria um, uh, was the most, uh, the highest association. And conversely then, the healthier the periodontal plaque, uh, the less chance there was of intimal thickening. So this um, provided the first direct evidence of a possible role of periodontal bacteria in atherosclerosis. So what about in human arteries? Well, at the time, DNA of some of the periodontal pathogens um, had been detected in arterial walls of uh, many, many patients. 
However, it was pointed out that this is not direct evidence of the presence of live bacteria um, because they could be dead and they, you know, were taken there by a phagocytic cell or some other means. So the isolation and cultivation of um, an organism and testing of its pathogenic properties are required to determine a causal relationship. Um, I mean, that's just a, a general rule. And worldwide, many attempts um, by many investigators uh, failed at being able to culture any of the periodontal organisms from the carotid, uh, say the carotid or the, um, the um, arteries um, associated with the heart, even though the DNA of the organism uh, was found there. So um, Dr. Kozarov um, in my lab um, decided to use uh, an unusual approach. So he went to the, or went to the um, OR, obtained disease, carotid artery sections. Um, and then we had human coronary artery endothelial cells growing in, in culture. So he ground up this car car carotid artery tissue added it to the endothelial cells. And several days later, uh, we were able to prove uh, using specific antibodies and fluorescent microscope that there were live Porphyrmonas gingivalis and a actinomycetum commutans, uh, which is, I'm not going to talk about today. It's not as important. Um, it doesn't, um, so. Here's the micrograph and the bacteria, the porphyromonas show up in green. And using this particular microscope, we could confirm that these bacteria were inside the cell, as you can see here. Um, so this was proof of the presence of the live periodontal pathogens in atherosclerosis. But what is unusual about the viable state of these bacteria that are in arteries, that they're viable, they're healthy, but when you try to culture them on an agar plate under conditions that you would normally grow, Porphyromonas gingivalis, they don't grow. Um, so I have a grant now that is um, studying uh, what this is. So we'll hopefully have the answer uh, very soon. So um, if we look at the biological basis for this periodontal disease cardiovascular connection, um, there are two potential mechanisms um, by which the oral bacteria could affect the cardiovascular system. And the first is simply inflammation. Um, the oral bacteria cause inflammation locally and the inflammatory factors then can disseminate uh, to throughout the body. But the primary mechanism is that the periodontal bacteria um, actually, I need the next slide. Um, they actually enter the bloodstream uh, through transient bacteremias. Um, so for example, when we chew or floss or brush our teeth, and certainly when we have dental procedures done, um, this allows bacteria that are around the teeth to enter um, the circulatory system. And it has um, been shown that on average, um, we have the equivalent of three hours a day of oral bacteria um, in our circulation. So it's not just a you know, 30 second kind of thing. Um, you know, if it's three hours a day, every day, um, it becomes significant. And then from uh, you know, it, the, bl the bloodstream, they can, the pathogens can migrate throughout the entire body. And so, um, as I mentioned, this is called the oral hematogenous spread of bacteria is considered the primary cause of the 
um, systemic diseases that are associated um, with the um, with periodontal periodontal disease. Okay. Um, so this is just I'm not because of time I'm not really going to. This is just a reiteration of what I um, had shown before. Um, so. Um, one of the questions was, can periodontal pathogens invade human cardiovascular cells? So we completed experiments to determine if any of the periodontal pathogens could invade primary, and this is important, they're directly from humans, artery endothelial cells in the laboratory. So we grew these cells um, in the laboratory, and then we added uh, different uh, bacteria to them. And what we found, uh, this is an example of Porphyromonas gingivalis um, and a scanning electron micrograph. You can see uh, this biofilm of bacteria on the surface. Um, and we think this is uh, the bacteria we're starting uh, to enter here. And this is um, a cross section of the cell. Um, all of these are the Porphyromonas gingivalis and we can see um, perfectly happy Porphyromonas gingivalis um, inside uh, the endothelial cell. So this was the first um, evidence of uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis being alive um, and demonstrating that they could actually um, invade the, um, <clears throat> the host cells. Um, I'm just going to skip this, this, uh, the next three. It's just an illustration of, uh, of the technique of how we were able to do this. So due to time, I'm just going to skip that. So we tested uh, over 20 different strains of Porphyromonas gingivalis. Um, and what we found were that they, there was a great variation in the ability of each of these strains to invade uh, the endothelial cells. There were strains that were very high invaders, um, invaded very easily and in high numbers. There was a second group that were moderate invaders. And then there were uh, some that are listed here as low invaders, but they didn't invade any more than the negative, uh, our negative control. So um, we consider these strains non-invaders. So the numbers and the names of these strains is not important. What's important here is that not all strains of Porphyromonas gingivalis um, are able to invade um, at least the, the endothelial cells. And why would this be important? Um, well, it could be important because it would be um, significant for an individual to know if he or she harbored an invasive strain in their um, biofilm around their teeth. And those that do, um, would we would predict would be at a much um, higher um, risk for cardiovascular disease uh, than the others. <clears throat> So this, this would, uh, what would happen then is the patient would be um, counseled and uh, really um, beaten over the head, so to speak, uh, about using a very good and consistent oral hygiene um, in order to uh, try to limit this infection. Um, and, the, and there may be some uh, dental procedures that, that could be done as well. So um, the question is also, is an intracellular location a mechanism for P. gingivalis to evade the immune system? Because it's inside a host cell, a human cell, um, then the immune system uh, you know, can't get at it. And is this um, thus set up a chronic infection uh, within the arterial walls? 
And as I say, this is to be answered, uh, but we hope to have an, an, uh, have an answer for it um, within, within the next year or two. So um, that was a, a broader and a more uh, deep discussion on cardiovascular disease. The rest of the talk, I would like to um, just uh, briefly talk about a couple of other diseases that are, uh, there's very um, significant evidence that porphyromonas gingivalis is involved. And one of these is rheumatoid arthritis. As you may know, rheumatoid arthritis is actually an autoimmune um, systemic disease um, that primarily manifests um, by chronic inflammation of the joints, but it is a systemic uh, disease and it affects um, other uh, parts of and organs of the body as well. So what is thought to be the mechanism, and I'll explain this, um, is aberrant citrullation of host proteins. Um, and so let me go to the next slide actually. So this um, is what this actually is, is that it's a modification of the amino acid arginine to citrulline um, in proteins. Um, and th this reaction is performed by enzymes called peptidyl arginine deaminases which we refer to as PADS. Um, so and autoantibodies to citrullinated proteins always precede the clinical signs and are found to be a predictor of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and this auto autoantibody response is strictly to citrullinated proteins. And this is unique to the disease rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> so the hu humans have uh, five different PAD uh, enzymes um, and we need them, um, but there's only one bacterial species in all of nature that has been found to have um, PAD enzymes and you guessed it, it's Porphyromonas gingivalis. Um, also, when uh, the antibodies to Porphyromonas gingivalis um, in a, an individual correlate directly with anti-citrullinated antibody titers. So it's now um, actually been demonstrated <clears throat> that infection with P. gingivalis um, using a rat model of rheumatoid arthritis um, causes um, rheumatoid arthritis and that it requires the enzyme, uh, uh, the PAD enzyme in PG. So the way this was done is P. gingivalis um, in the laboratory, um, a mutant that knocked out the PAD enzyme was created and then that strain and the wild type strain that had the intact um, PAD enzyme um, were put in this rabbit model. And the rabbits that had the wild type or the original strain uh, developed rheumatoid arthritis and those um, which did not have the um, PAD, those ra rabbits did not uh, develop um, rheumatoid arthritis. So um, it is pro proposed um, for the overall mechanism of rheumatoid arthritis that, as I mentioned previously, oral citrullination of human and bacterial um, proteins by P. gingivalis prior to the onset of RA triggers of the, the body individual to produce antibodies in response to the PG infection. Um, and this infection has caused citrullination of the proteins and this establishes the autoimmune disease. So the mechanism by which porphyromonas is involved in rheumatoid arthritis is totally different 
from the mechanism by which it um, causes atherosclerosis. So in atherosclerosis, um, PG um, enters the bloodstream and invades uh, the primary cells of the of uh, atherosclerosis and damages them. But th in this case, um, there doesn't need to be any invasion of host cells. Okay. Um, so I'd also, um, for the last thing, like to talk about Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is probably one of the most recent um, discoveries of um, an association with Porphyromonas uh, gingivalis. Um, first of all, we know that PG is often found in the brains of um, Alzheimer's patients, and that epidemiological studies show there is an association between the two diseases, which means that if you have periodontal disease, you're more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease uh, than someone um, who doesn't. So the question then, is this really a far-fetched idea that P. P. gingivalis could be involved in Alzheimer's disease? Well, it turns out, I don't think so. Um, because of um, some, a series of experiments that were done in um, mice. Um, and these mice um, are a model for Alzheimer's disease, uh, meaning that they will develop Alzheimer's disease with age. So when PG, um, again, was just put on the tongue um, of the mice, um, it resulted in PG being found in the brains of the mice that were developing Alzheimer's. And secondly, uh, P. gingivalis mutants that had deletions in uh, gingipane genes. And gingipane genes are, G are for enzymes that actually break down proteins. So when the P. gingivalis mutants could not break down proteins, they could not cause Alzheimer's disease. So a drug was developed to inhibit uh, these gingipanes and tested in this model. And it protected, protected the mice from developing Alzheimer's disease. Even more significant, um, if Alzheimer's disease mice, the mice who already had Alzheimer's disease were administered this drug, it resulted in reversal of the Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So uh, more recently then, um, it's been reported that uh, PG can actually enter and invade human um, brain cells in culture in the laboratory, uh, just like um, we demonstrated for the um, endothelial cells um, of the arteries, and that we know that PG can survive within these brain cells and actually take over control of the host cell's metabolism um, for its own benefit um, and survival, but it also allows the host cell to survive at least to some degree. If you're a pathogen, you really don't want to kill the host cell that you're living in. Um, so we microbiologists always think that pathogens um, that survive um, and, but don't kill um, their host cell um, have evolved um, um, more than those pathogens that just kill the host cells. So it's not known how long PG survives. Um, uh, but as I, as I pointed out, um, it's likely that PG invades additional um, brain cells. Um, this invasion has um, been shown to be very similar to that which we found in endothelial cells. And it's actually quite a remarkable story. So what happens when uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis um, can sense that there is a host cell that it wants to invade, um, even before it 
attaches to the host cell, it sends a signal to that cell and it already changes the metabolism and it um, causes that host cell to increase um, a um, type of, it's called autophagy. Um, and it's a, a mechanism of host cells that they use when they're um, under stress. But the PG survives, enters and survives into uh, the vesicles that are part of autophagy. So it's pretty amazing, I think, um, that PG, I mean, PG is not the only organism that has been found to have a, a similar mechanism, but the PG actually controls the host cell metabolism before it even adheres um, to the host cell. Um, I just wanted to man mention respiratory infections, um, and this is actually quite simple. Um, so when breathing tubes are inserted um, in individuals that often dra times drag oral bacteria into the throat um, and the pulmonary um, system, uh, which can cause infections in the lungs. Um, so my final slide um, on the particular diseases, I just list um, those that are, that have been shown um, to be associated with Porphyromonas gingivalis. And one of the other um, more recent and interesting stories is that of cancer. Um, Porphyromonas, um, it's not surprising that it would be um, associated with certain types of oral cancer but it's also been shown um, to cause liver um, cancer in an animal model. Um, so I think we don't know the extent of the um, negative effects of porphyromonas um, on, on our bodies. Um, but um, in addition, um, P. gingivalis has been shown to um, cause women to deliver early uh, and produce low birth weight um, babies. It's associated with diabetes, knee infections, and I've already uh, mentioned the respiratory infections. Okay, so what's the significance of all of this? Okay, as I said before, patients infected with only the cell invasive strains may be at risk, for example, for cardiovascular disease and the other chronic diseases. So this makes the development of a simple assay for detection of the presence of invasive or pathogenic strains uh, possible and likely. So the way this will work is um, when you go for a dental uh, checkup or you go for a medical, your annual medical checkup, um, some of your saliva will be taken and um, there will be a quick assay that's done uh, at chair side. And within 10 minutes, um, this assay will be able to tell the clinician and you if, you if these strains are present in your oral cavity. And so you could imagine then um, if they are, then uh, as I said before, you really wanna pump up your um, dental hygiene so this would um, then evaluate the effectiveness of treatment uh, also in dental hygiene practices. So um, say um, appointment one, uh, the patient is found to have these strains, uh, then um, dental hygiene, strict dental hygiene practices um, are followed. And three months later, the patient comes in and the test is run again. Um, if it's the presence of these pathogenic strains that's still there, then continued um, and maybe perhaps even some surgical procedures could be done. Um, and if the patient uh, no longer has the strains, um, the, they would get a pat on the back and say, you're doing great, continue, don't change anything that you're doing. 
So my overall conclusions from this is that there really is compelling evidence that there is a linkage between oral pathogenic bacteria and several systemic diseases. And we know that this is likely caused by this oral, oral hematogenous spread of bacteria. And we also know that PG uh, has multiple mechanisms of causing uh, these diseases. Um, and I'm just going to um, briefly go over the slide and say that um, consults and collaborations between the dental and medical practitioners um, should become um, ge a general procedure and it will become crucial to the health of the patients. And I asked the question in the very beginning, uh, what effect does um, infection or the presence of periodontitis, uh, specifically porphyromonas, have on the public health? Um, and I think hopefully now you, you uh, would agree with me that it has a tremendous um, impact on public health and as well as treatment paradigms. My final conclusion then is that the mouth is part of and connected to the body. And therefore what happens in the mouth affects the body and vice versa. For a hundred years, um, dentists have considered the mouth um, as its own entity and that it has um, very little interaction uh, with the rest of the body. And so uh, this paradigm is um, changed. So one of my students um, did this for me. Um, if you don't brush, then you're going to have heart problems. And finally, um, I would just like to um, thank all of those who have contributed um, to this, uh, this study. And I don't know what my time is at this point, but I certainly would be happy to take questions. So thank you very much, Anne. I think that was a very informative lecture once we got over the initial <laughs> technical yeah. questions. And I congratulate you on uh, finishing actually exactly on time, despite, oh. <laughs> despite all of that, uh, that trouble <laughs> at, at the beginning. Uh, and I'm sure there must be a lot of people who have some questions uh, since many of us are worried about several of the diseases uh, that you, uh, I see Keith Berg has a question. And Ken, I have one here in the Oak Room too, but Keith, go ahead. Yes, um, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you very much for it. Um, uh, one thought crossed my mind and I may, have some of the facts wrong? If so, uh, feel free to correct me. Uh, uh, I, a, a situation called arterial um, uh, strokes, where you have uh, the, the, the problem, the blockage is occurring in very small arteries. And they, uh, yes. and the, it's apparently, as I understand it, it's a very difficult thing to determine the extent or if you're having those, it's kind of, it's presumed under certain circumstances, but without any real direct evidence. So I'm kind of wondering if we couldn't use some sort of the oral pathogen route to see if uh, it's a way to assay something that's not currently by using the met typical methods possible. Well, that's a really, Really interesting question. So basically you're suggesting that the oral pathogen could be a marker of the disease. Right, I mean, that's the question actually. Yes, yes. I don't know, it. I don't think anyone has ever thought of that or looked into that, uh, but I think we, we do have the, um, where the antibodies, the specific antibodies, uh, uh, specific DNA, that that could be possible. Um, yes, that, that's a very interesting suggestion. Question for you. How often do you use antiseptic mouthwash? I'm sorry, I, quite, I didn't quite understand. How often do you, do you use antiseptic mouthwash? Oh, do I use? Um, <clears throat> 
To be honest, no. <laughs> but it certainly doesn't. It certainly doesn't hurt. Um, I think so. The problem with mouthwash is that it stays in your mouth only for a minute or two. You know, so it doesn't. It's not there long enough um, to really get down into the biofilm. Um, um, but um, it it you know would be effective against um, some. Um, of the biofilm. Now, there have been, this is why antibacterial um, gels have been developed. So instead of the mouthwash, it's a gel um, that you, um, you know, just brush on your teeth and, and let it stay there for a little bit. Um, so it's not washed away um, so quickly. And uh, so, some dentists use that for their patients. Okay, we do have a few questions here on chat. Should a saliva test be part of an annual dental exam? What is your opinion on tongue scraping? Oh, tongue scraping. <clears throat> um, I haven't put a lot of thought into that, um, but if you do have halitosis, especially, tongue scraping can be very effective. So if you look at it this way, so you use a toothbrush to remove the bacteria that are on or around your teeth. So tongue scraping would be the same um, mechanism, um, but removing bacteria um, from your tongue. Now we know that you need good bacteria um, in these areas. So you never want to get rid of, you know, all the bacteria. Um, and if the good bacteria are there, um, they inhibit the bad bacteria um, from, from colonizing. Um, so I have, no, I have no problem with tongue scraping um, at all. Um, and I think more, it depends on the individual because, uh, you know, more people have for the lack of a better word, I'll call it plaque or biofilm um, on their tongues than others. Um, so I'm sorry, that's kind of a long answer um, to your question. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, that's my opinion. Okay, um, I'm gonna give it over to Pushpa here. And then we do have just another minute or two because they have to transition this room. So go ahead, Pushpa. I, I had a question regarding the evidence for Alzheimer's, the correlation between Alzheimer's and uh, this bacteria. The evidence you presented was in mice. Have there any studies been done in the brains of Alzheimer's patients after, after death, whether the, the, the bacteria is present in those tangles and, and plaques? Yes, yes. Um, after, yes, the brains after death, when they're examined, often um, um, Porphyrmonas gingivalis will be, will be found um, in those patients. Not every time. And my, my view is that um, Porphyrmonas gingivalis is probably not the only cause of um, Alzheimer's. I mean, I think it's now recognized that there are different um, there are multiple causes of Alzheimer's with, that all result in the same, uh, same thing, but therefore there are different mechanisms and different causes um, that are possible. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed your talk and thank you very much for giving it. Well, okay. thank you all for your patience. I, I, I apologize for wasting your time. No, not at all. Not Can I dollar. offer, um, if anyone else has further questions, maybe they could email me and then I could forward them to you, doctor? Sure. Okay. Sure. All righty. I'm sorry, we're going to have to uh, let Ken Burns finish us up here. Okay. You'll be sorry you said that. Uh, <laughs> first, you point out that the mouth is connected to the body. I must observe that in some politicians, it's not clear it's connected <laughs> to the brain. Uh, okay. And yeah. secondly, secondly, uh, 
you've raised the question about uh, the development of uh, introduction of probiotics uh, into the mouth to compete maybe with, uh, with the bad bacteria. But let me just say, Anne, uh, I really appreciated your talk. I think it really uh, was perfect for the intent of this course. And uh, you'll hear from us again, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for in inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Please feel free to email me and I can uh, send on your questions um, since we ran out of time. Happy to do that. Thank you, everyone. Stay well. See you next week. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.